My name is Thomas Lloyd. Uh, welcome to the Cathedral. On behalf of the Cathedral and the Anti-Racism Commission of the Diocese, thank you so much for participating in this. And I want to thank my clinicians, Linnell Joy Jenkins and Terry Lipson. Terry Lipson. And Jay Llewellyn. And I'd like to start us in prayer. I'll be praying for us from a prayer that's in your leaflet, the words of Martin Luther King. <clears throat> Let us pray. We thank you, O God, for your church, founded upon your word, that challenges us to do more than sing and pray but go out and work as though the very answer to our prayers depended on us and not upon you. Help us to realize that humanity was created to shine like the stars and live on through all eternity. Keep us, we pray, in perfect peace. Help us to walk together, pray together, sing together, live together until that day when all God's children, black, white, red, brown, and yellow, will rejoice in one common bond of humanity. In the reign of our Lord and of our God, we pray. Amen. 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 So the first thing I want to say is right off the bat, one of the questions that comes up quite a bit nowadays is who has the right to sing the spirituals? And that's a very complex topic, and we're not gonna delve into that in depth today, but I want you to know that the people who are here uh, working with you believe that everyone should sing the spirituals, but in order to do so with respect, they need to learn about where the spirituals came from, the people who created them, what it meant to them, and then find a connection within themselves to that same way of being, that same humanity. The reason why some are, are saying very emphatically now that only people who are descendants of the people who created these spirituals should sing them is because of the unfortunate and long legacy of blackface minstrelsy, which if you're not familiar with it, is not just a, uh, a small thing in the American scene. For over a century and a half, from the early 19th century, well into the TV era, mid 20th century, Amos and Andy, it was the mainstream of American entertainment. It wasn't just a sideline, it was it. It was Netflix. It's where people went to be entertained. And what that performance was, were white people performing the music that had been imagined by the enslaved in a ridiculing way that made them feel okay for being so cruel to them. It was a way of rationalizing, these people are, are not human like me, so it's okay that I treat them like this. At the same time, they actually really liked the music because the music was distinctive uh, and it had character and it began a long love-hate relationship between white America and the traditions of the black musical diaspora, which are quite varied and diverse and are known around the world today as America's distinctive music. That and the musical theater uh, that grew up the Jewish community in the Lower East Side, immigrants singing in Yiddish, who then collaborated with jazz musicians from New Orleans to make the other, one of the other forms of music that's distinctive as being truly American. The response and where we come from, where we connect, is when the spirituals first came to the public through the Fisk Jubilee Singers in the 1870s. Their mission was to raise money so that a new, one of the first historical black colleges and universities that we understand now could survive. And Jubilee Hall stands today as a monument to their success. People did not know the spirituals outside of the community, and their function within the community was not 
performance for an audience. It was the whole community engaged at once in singing. And so taking that next step to perform, they were very careful in their arrangements and the words that they published to use uh, the Queen's English at the time, Queen Victoria, who they ended up singing for. Because it was important to them that their singing and these holy songs be held up as a proof and indication that the people who were enslaved were as fully human as anyone else, who were as fully alive and worthy of respect as anyone else. And the literature that they brought forth and created has proved to be durable. It's truly remarkable, just purely musically, purely in the combination of music and text. And one of the things that we've done at the cathedral, uh, which is the first few pieces we're going to do, is there's so many ways to incorporate this music into worship, no matter the color or uh, background of the community. In fact, for musicians who are more comfortable with the European tradition, uh, the spirituals are more accessible stylistically than some of the other forms, like jazz and like gospel. Um, they, there's no one correct way to sing the spirituals. There are incorrect ways, and those incorrect ways have to do with disrespect, to bringing in any trace of mockery or, or looking down uh, or making fun of. And there's a fine line, because sometimes the enthusiasm of a white college choir, as I know, uh, can get a little carried away and, and lose that perspective. But there's so many places in our worship that this great literature can find a place. One of them here in the cathedral was during Lent. Uh, we have the same style of anthem for the five weeks of Lent. We have an anthem after the sermon, and we have an anthem during communion because we like people to be able to focus on communion and not focus on singing. And several years ago, I found this book, which there's copies in the back you can look at, American Negro Songs by John W. Work III, who is third generation Fisk Jubilee singers and one of their teachers and guides. And this book contains a lot of their arrangements, which are in the form of simple four-part call and response arrangements that work beautifully in the time of Lent, when you want things to be a little bit spare and direct from the heart. And so we pair these spirituals with the other anthems being either um, Tudor anthems of Bird and Talus and so on, which also have their form of simplicity, or this past year, uh, cantata movements uh, from Johann Sebastian Bach. And I like to compare Bach to the writers of the spirituals because there, there are two things they have in common. One, the spirituals are immensely durable. And what I mean by that is they have been performed in so many different ways. Quintets, larger choirs, huge choirs, soloists. Uh, they became civil rights songs. Uh, they've been used in all different kinds of contexts around the world. And yet they still keep their identity. You, you can't destroy them because the melodies are so distinctive. And the words that go with them, which are few, are perfectly tied together and express human emotion in a most direct and, and simple way. And if you look at the arias of Bach, why is Bach such a great composer? Not because he's complicated. His arias are always based on one idea, one melodic idea and one short piece of text. And that melodic idea is distinct, but stays in the memory, it stays with you, you remember it. In fact, in the Passions, you probably remember the arias if you know it more than you remember the choruses or anything else. And that's, that's what this music has. So let's sing. Enough of uh, talking. The first one to look at, lead me to the rock. Now the first thing about the context of the spirituals is that they, many of the spirituals, not all, but many of the spirituals are code spirituals. They're coded messages within them. The plantation master may have thought that they were just, it was just a sign that they were content with their lot uh, because they knew they, they counted on being rewarded in heaven and they were okay with not being rewarded here. But in reality, they were actually talking and giving signals about when the next group was going to leave, leave to go on the Underground Railroad. And the rock, the 
foundation of faith in which Peter established the church was also symbolic of the rock looking over into the promised land of freedom, be it Canada or beyond the Mason-Dixon line. And that's what this spiritual offers. Look, this is very long. Um, <laughs> just sing along with me once. someone in your choir do the call and response for the verses. You want to sing, Carrie? Did I hear a voice? having been sung by the Fisk Jubilee Singers in Oberlin's Finney Chapel, where I went to school. Uh, they went to a conference there to try to get attention. Things weren't going well. And somebody said, why don't you go up in the balcony? They didn't want them to sit down below, because everybody down below uh, looked different than they did. But during one of the breaks, they sang Steal Away. And they got the attention of so many ministers at that point that their tour was set for the next several months, all over the East Coast and then eventually to England. Um, one of the uh, one of the new books, and I have in the back listing, and then on the table, is in their own words, "Slave Life and the Power of Spirituals" by Eileen Duncan. Hmm. And this is an incredible resource because what she has done, her her main project, was to go and investigate the written and spoken testimonies of formerly enslaved people. There were quite a few written. Uh, during the 19th century, and then in the 1920s and 30s, part of the Works Progress Administration, people were put to work going out in the field and getting recorded. And so this is one of those related to the theme of Steal Away. After my conversion, this is by a gentleman named Thomas Lewis Johnson. After my conversion, I would often steal away to Jesus with other slaves to some quiet place for prayer, over the stable or in the kitchen when the master and mistress were away. Though we knew that if we were discovered, we should be locked up for the night, and the next morning we should receive from five to nine or even thirty lashes for unlawfully assembling together. Over five slaves in such gathering, though they had passes, constituted an unlawful assembly. At night, no slave was allowed to be out without a pass from his master. We used to have such a good time at these meetings, though. No wonder the Fist Jubilee singers sang with such deep feeling when those of them who were once slaves remembered the meetings of this kind, at which they sang and prayed almost in a whisper for fear of being heard. How appropriate to sing softly and quietly, steal away. Let's sing a little bit of, of this one. Again, it's call and response. Jane, you want to lead us in? Sure. <clears throat>
again, this is, these, this is the heart of the spirituals, where they started, where they began to be presented to the world. Um, much more happened thereafter, and we will hear some next from... Who's next on the I think oh. I am. Linnell. From the same book that was read just a little earlier, I took a clipping out of there. It's just so beautiful the way Dr. Eileen got there right. Baptism was a ritual of great importance to converted slaves. This baptismal song offers multiple levels of meaning. The slaves took courage from the story in John 5, um, verses 2 to 4, describing the man who was healed after stepping into the troubled waters of the pool of Bethesda. Slaves believed that God would overturn the status quo by troubling the water, therefore, thereby freeing them. The band that Moses led might refer to the liberation of the Hebrews led by Moses. It also might have referred to another liberator, Harriet Tubman, who was called Moses. Tubman is said to have hummed this melody as a signal for escapees to move to the water where their scent was less likely to be picked up by the pursuing dogs. All the while the singer sang on, said Vincent Harding in his book, there is a river. Somewhere in Virginia or Maryland they sang, come along Moses, don't get lost. We are the people of God. And Harriet Tubman responded with, let me get it here. Wade in the water, wade in the water, wade in the water, God's going to trouble the water. Wade in the water, wade in the water.
one, I have been redeemed. What's, what's the one? Oh, have you got good religion? Certainly, Lord. And I think you have that. Um, and I'm going to ask who would like to sing bass today? Anyone want to sing bass today? Fantastic. Any tenors today? How about altos? Any sopranos? Super sopranos? Yeah, you can sing any part you want. If you want to sing tenor today, you could. So I'm going to ask the basis first. But since we're talking about oh. baptism, have you got good religion? Certainly, Lord. Have you got good religion? Certainly, Lord. Have you got good religion? Certainly, Lord. Have you got good religion? Certainly. Thank you. 
congregation, one where you just had that call and response and um, waiting the water, allowed them to be able to use their own vocabulary to be able to insert the permit there. And then having um, certainly more, be able to allow each of those parts to be able to say <coughs> part, as well as learning the part, um, just have someone double for them, or just have them all someone do something that call and response is very, um, uh, such a, an important style for um, spirituals. And then for swing lows and chariot, and also for all night and day, you have an opportunity just to do a simple um, partner song where you don't have to worry so much about the harmony. It will immediately um, usher in with the partner song. It's going to tag team. All right. So if you could find Deep River, Deep River. Um, so I just want to reiterate some of the themes that have been sort of happening as we've been having this discussion. Um, you know, I love that Tom talked about Bach and the spirituals. Um, you know, we, we I, I teach high school and I teach Ivy Music, the Ivy Music curriculum, and they just changed the curriculum actually um, to be nonlinear. Mm. Which, which for me was very disturbing. <laughs> but when you think about our young people, they learn in this nonlinear fashion. Right? They're just always getting this information. But the reality is, Bach and the spirituals are about linearity, right? They're about source, they're about origins. Yes, of course, you can study Mozart and Beethoven without studying Bach, but why? Bach, Mozart knew Bach. Beethoven knew Bach's music, right? You're going to the source when you go to Bach. So it's the same thing uh, with the spirituals. Uh, I was just reading the 1619 Project. The Motown, the spirituals, just like, uh, you know, Tom was saying that the humanity that we find in the spirituals was the same type of humanity that Motown was building for blacks here. And so there's this continuum, there's this sequence of ideas and concepts. So that's why, that's why we should study the spirituals, um, and that's why we should... Um, really expose them to as many people as possible because we're really getting to the source. All right, so Deep River, we're going to do two things with this. We're going to read the notes on the page. Um, I uh, love this particular arrangement. It's in the Lift Your Voice and Sing uh, hymnal. So uh, I want you to, you know, not be afraid to use your Lift Your Voice and Sing hymnals uh, in your churches. And so this is a beautiful arrangement. I've done this myself. I am uh, at St. Thomas, as many of you may have read. Um, and I have done this particular arrangement with my choir just as a part of the service. There might be a little spot in the service, and I read the notes right off the page. So let's, uh, let's, let's see what we got. I'm going to play along with you, then we'll try an acapella. Here we go. One, two, three. <laughs>
we're going to do something a little different with this now. So um, I am an arranger and composer, so I, Spirit has been such an important anchor in all of the music I write and make. So I created an arrangement of this. So I want you to think you can also be imaginative. Tom mm -hmm. talked about how, you know, we, we can do almost anything with these spirituals. Mm -hmm. So I've arranged this for many, arranged this for a friend of mine, Reggie Pindell, many, many years ago. And so we're going to learn that arrangement. All you have to do is sing the melody, sing the melody. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to accompany you at the piano. You're all going to get to be soloists on this. Sing whatever octave is comfortable for you. We're just going to sing the melody. I'm going to put a little interlude. We're going to sing Deep River two times. I'm going to put a little interlude between each one. And then we're going to go to the next one. All right, here we go. So here's the feel that I wrote this for my friend. I probably have, I don't know, 10 arrangements of every spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> Completely different styles, different types. That's all right. Yeah. Just, you know. So here's, here's, here's my, my take on Deep River. is not the spiritual. It's probably the only not spiritual here <laughs> in all of this, but it is inspired mm, yes. by spirituals. Yes. Um, and so I'm going to play for you one, one little uh, interesting thing. <laughs> if you were just to look at the music, yes. thank you. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I actually heard this performed many, many years ago, exactly like this. And if I look at the music, and I've never heard this song before, and I see it, I'm going to do this. Musician who who never heard the song before, um, and you know, just didn't know the, the the true tempo of the song. So I actually sang in the Saint Cecilia's choir when John D. Cooper wrote this song. This he wrote this um, in and around the years of 17, 1976, 1977, and around that time, he wrote it for one of the soloists in the choir, Judy Poindexter. And uh, she was an untrained soprano, but she had a phenomenal voice. And you heard her sing this song. It was just, um, brought tears to people's eyes. So the correct tempo for this song is this. I my salvation, what I have seen. Sing with me. One, two, three. Lord, I have seen.
little thing before I pass the time. The way I've done this with my choir, originally it was a solo piece, and it was, it was originally done in A-flat major. So it was included in Lift Every Voice and Sing as a way to invite congregations to sing this melody and, and this music. So what I would do with my choir when it goes up to the high G, which a lot of congregations don't have a high G, <laughs> just pick a note in the chord, right? So uh, it can be A flat, uh, I'm sorry, G, E flat, C, or A, whatever is most comfortable for your voice at that time. Let's try the refrain, fell on my knees. When we get to the I, the fermata, just sing with whatever note's comfortable for your voice. Here we go. Fell on my knees, down at the sure that we all understood and embraced the fact that sometimes it's going to be an experience that you're not going to have those little black dots. You're going to have people, that's the times you don't even understand what those little black dots are going to do. So we want to be able to teach you to And the other part of it that I would like for you to realize is that we're going to deal with being individuals. Mm. This is an arrangement I did many years ago, and I must admit I change it depending on what the purpose is. Sometimes I just put it right in there, a different part and whatnot. There is going to be six to eight different parts when we get to the end. But it's very easy. There's no words that you have to write down because it just deals with the message of this train is bound for glory. So we're going to start off with basically unison and then it's going to break off into a very traditional harmony. Now, what you have to realize is if we're doing by rote, you have to be very specific in what you're imitating and what you're singing. So the way that I sing it is the way that I want you to do it, meaning I want all of those little breaks in there, the inflections I want in there. Because the thing about gospel music also, I should say spirituals and gospel music, is that it comes from a feeling. It comes from a feeling, even more than just what the words say. It comes from a depth that comes from in your soul. So what you're talking about is this train is bound. So, of course, we're not talking about a choo-choo train here, all right? We're talking about your soul. We're talking about your spirit. We're talking about something that just gives people life, all right? So, therefore, we're going to sing it that way. This train is bound for glory. This train. Let me hear you sing that, please. Ready? Yeah. This train is bound for glory. This train. Now, what did you notice? I cut off that reed, didn't I? We're going to cut off that ring. Ready? And this train is bound to glory. This train. All right, man. Now we're going to break it up. Now we're going to break it up a little. First one is unison, then it'll break off. All right? Let, let me do this. I want to keep it safe. Let's keep it safe. Um, give me everybody on the first one and then the second one. 
let me just do deal with the top voices. So if you believe yourself to be a soprano, if you believe yourself to be a soprano, raise your hand for me, please. I just know who to look at. All right. There you go. Aren't you a soprano? Aren't you a soprano? I think you're a soprano. <laughs> All right, all right. Um, altos, please. Altos, please raise your hand if you believe yourself to be an alto. Um, tenors. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I know you. Okay. Um, my basses. Oh, you just threw me when you raised your hand. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to have to ask this. It's baritone. There's going to be some splits that's going to happen. Okay, later on, but let me just take care of that now. Okay, excellent. Good. Baritone, because there's a little baritone, little specialty that happens in here. Um, now, my sopranos, I do a desk camp with, actually there's like regular soprano, nice and high sopranos, and I know we have that. But then we also have okay. a high soprano, those sopranos that can hit those high A's. I, I know where to look at some of my group is here, so I know, I know, I know, they, I know what they can do. Okay? Um, and then there's even a higher part, but that we, we'll deal with. We'll see if I have that higher part today. Okay. Yeah. Sopranos. Ready? Sopranos sing. Yeah. This train is bound for glory. This train. Let me get on three. Continue. This train is bound for glory. This train. Get off of the ring. Get off of it. what's right next to you, okay? Basses, you're going to start this thing off and it's going to come in one on top of each other. Everybody has something totally different. But what's important to me with this is that each of this has a message in it. Everybody's saying something different, saying it at different times, of course in different ranges and different ways, okay? So I need you to say it as if you are telling people come get on this train. You're, you're, you're being the disciples that we were told to be. We're telling everybody, come, come on then, let's go, time to go. All right? Now, basses, you're going to start this. Basses. You're going to 
what you're saying is bound for glory, got to be holy. Bound for glory, got to be holy. Bound, give me a good beat. Train. Train. Now we're at the end of the station. When you get to the end of the song, you're going to go, shh. Get it? All right. Y'all did great. You did great. Okay. Thank you, Carrie. And for, for musicians trained in the European style, we're used to doing notes. And we're used to looking down on people that don't do from notes. And that's crazy because oral tradition is so vital a part. And in the tradition where it's all about the notes, and then not even the notes, but they want to know is a quarter rest here? Yeah, pencil it in. Eighth rest there. Because it takes a long time to get to the music that way. And so it's a good training going back and forth to learn by ear, to learn by rote, and also to learn together, to be listening to each other rather than just isolated in your score. Anyway, we're going to take a five-minute stretch break. Uh, there's restrooms over here. There's water fountains over there. There's water uh, tank with cups in the back. There's some books to look at. Be back here in five minutes.